Hello, I'm Eileen Kaner, Professor of Public Health and Primary Care Research in our Medical Faculty at Newcastle University. I'm here to introduce our Insights lecturer tonight, Adam Gridley. Adam is going to give a lecture to help us mark World Mental Health Day and his talk covers his own lived experience of drug use and mental health difficulties. Adam first used drugs during a gap year from university as part of a means of building his own self-confidence and popularity whilst making new friends. He talks about his journey into mental health difficulties, including a number of stays in hospital due to self-harm. More importantly, he shares with us his journey out of mental health difficulties and into a place of health and increased sense of wellness. And Adam wants to share with us some of the insights that he has learned along this personal journey. I hope you enjoy the lecture. Hello, this is Ad Gridley's There and Back Again, A Journey Through Mental Illness, or Cannabis Induced Psychosis, Cannabis Associated Psychosis. That's the photo of me on the left, got my dreadlocks, I grew my hair. The truth was I didn't like leaving the flat back then. I would have my six Cronenbergs every evening, 40 or so cigarettes, maybe uh, tobacco, but I was very unhealthy. I was eating lots and lots of jam and peanut butter with no real thought for like, I was 15 or 16 stone, so not in a good place. Grew my hair, not really out of choice, just I didn't know what else to do, just gave it no thought. Ideally, it would have been brushed every day. I know that now, but at the time it just turned into dreadlocks. I managed to get them uh, cut off at the local hairdressers on a zero all over, so it was shaved to the skin. And I felt good in a way, but soon I became so anxious because I thought people would look at me and they see a right wing extremist Nazi. So this really got to me. No one said anything, but on buses and, and walking around streets, uh, this, uh, this, this bothered me so much that I ended up back on the wards again. And I was always to be found with a bag of fresh spinach leaves because I knew that spinach um, would help your hair grow. So before I was ever ill, I had a steady girlfriend. I was playing basketball. I was playing tennis. I was playing badminton. I was doing martial arts. I was playing Spanish guitar, grade five piano I had. I had eight A to C GCSEs, uh, three A levels, a C in French and a C in physics and a B in biology. I wouldn't do drugs because I thought drug users try and escape from reality, but I was quite pleased that I didn't mind my reality. I didn't want to escape from it as such. I wouldn't smoke cigarettes because my dad used to and the smell in the car, so, and, and the cost. And I um, wouldn't, wouldn't drink, drink alcohol really, except for the weekends, this was. So, yeah, I went to Canada, of course, and I had to come back by 1996, uh, September 96, it was a deferred entry place on the psychology degree course the University of uh, London and I was I was looking forward to it but also I was looking forward to my gap year me I paid for part of it working at Pizza Hut and my dad paid for the other part of it this company arranged flights work permits like the, the university the actual jobs and uh, a support person out there too so everything was worked out you had to turn up and start work for a year but all the martial arts that I'd learned uh, was that if you keep doing it until you're 80 or 90, you become so hyper vigilant and super aware of things, you'll pick up the bad vibes of someone who's going to mug you and you'll go a different way or something like that. But then I, I read that if you smoke a joint, 
you can get that straight away. So I thought this is brilliant. Circumnavigate 80 or 90 years into just one joint for the same effect. So I went to Canada thinking I'm going to get really stoned. Well, I'm going to get stoned at least and see what happens. I didn't do anything like kayaking, whitewater rafting. There were geothermal vents. There was a sulfur hot springs 20, 25 minutes away. Didn't go there at all. Didn't do any hiking, nothing unique to Canada. Uh, I nearly got attacked by an elk, but that was it. You know, in the whole year, I did. I took maybe five photos, and I, I think, I don't know where they are. Um, it should have been the holiday of a lifetime, but for me, I found that it was a great way to make friends. I was an English stoner, so I had those two things really working for me. They were my unique selling points, if you like, my USPs. In England, I'd never felt I was anything special, but in Canada, I was a world traveler who, who, who gets cooked or baked or such accessible terms for getting stoned. In England, it's like mashed or whatever it is. But over there, just getting drunk will be called polluted. And the whole thing, it's a heady mix of, uh, of social world. What I did find was that if I, if I got baked enough, I would become hyper creative so I used to get uh, used to get bait with my stash and write reams and reams of poetry. Didn't really go anywhere because I didn't know what to believe in at the time. But those around me that I worked with, especially at the second place, because the Banff Alberta, that's the Banff, Banff Springs you can see there. Very, very prestigious hotel. I got thrown out because I was getting cooked at work and they couldn't have that kind of subversive element working at such a great place it's a four and a half star hotel the reason why it's not five stars is because it was it was created it's a colonial castle so it doesn't have any inbuilt air conditioning so it loses half a star i mean it sort of makes it count for even better open fires everywhere i got fired from there at the second place i managed to get a job i was um I was not the only stoner at all. Everyone was in some, on some level, were involved with the drug trade in Banff. So it's an honor amongst these, sort of like a villainy thing. But even though they called me Shakespeare and I went to New York to seek my fortune, I, I wasn't looking forward to coming back, but I knew I had to. This psychology course, studying the mind, when I, I used to joke that I'd open, my mind was open, but it's so open that it spilled out and I couldn't close it again. So I, will, I, will, I was psychotic before I even knew what the word meant. When your priorities are all upside down and every moment is expanded and very hard to deal with. So I thought getting stoned even more will be the answer. The lecturer would say things if I made it into a lecture, Things like, um, so what is a thought? Or how do we formulate memories? And I thought they were doing this just to upend me, to flummox me, because I didn't know the answers. Other people did. These are questions that there are answers to. But for me, without an A-level, and a year older than everyone else as well, so still there's another degree of remove from the, the rest of my classmates, and I would just freeze up in social situations. I had nothing useful or intelligent or, or interesting to say. And I would laugh at the wrong times, very socially awkward. For a whole year, my reply would have been, let's roll another doobie or whatever that they call it. So I was out of practice with social situations, had no banter. I went to a boys school, so there's lots of mum put downs and jokes and things. I had nothing really to say. So in August 2005, I went on a rampage, I mentioned in my book. I left the house with my keys, but the bare essentials, uh, cigarettes, uh, a lighter, freedom pass, bank card with like 50 pound in the bank account. Uh, and I had no pockets in my jogging bottoms, which is very strange. I had no uh, socks, which also was strange. It was summer, but normally I wear these things. And I left the house thinking, I'm never going to return. I'm going to leave. 
I left my house. And I didn't tell anyone any of this too. I, used, I was very good at hiding things, for better or worse. I left the house and I ended up putting, uh, being psychically drawn to these two different doorsteps. One where I left, the first key was in Stratford in the east. The other was in West London in Kensington in the west. And I threw out all my guitarpine and my citalopram. I mean, I'm a whole, on quite a few more than more pills than that now but at the time it's like these supercilious doctors they're younger than me how can they how can they know my mind better than a pretend to know me at least so it was me rebelling i was drinking cans of booze that i found on the floor i was drinking from rain puddles sometimes God knows what people over like seeing me do that must have thought, but I was just feral. I didn't have, have any fights, but I was I was acting very strange uh, uh, with lots of different people. There was uh, one one time where I was smoking a joint with this person in, in like a record shop, and then just left. I mean, I must have been insulting all these people, but I had no real grasp of uh, social etiquette or anything like that. I thought I had to tear my clothing. So I, I appeared an interesting person because that's what I'd always wanted when I was in Canada. The best thing, strangely, that happened to me was that I got arrested. I saw this uh, pub named after a president. My dad famously in the family had problems with this president and his policies so I thought if I attack this pub in some way my dad would be proud of me and I'll be redeemed because he was blamed a bit for going to Canada so I went inside had a snoop around I tried one of the sugar cubes put it back in its dish it must have looked a bit strange but I didn't care I was on a mission and I selected the, um, the window that I was going to attack. And when the brick goes through, it won't hit anyone on the other side if I choose the window where there's a cutlery trolley, the other side. So I went across the road, found half brick in a convenient pile of rubble and threw this brick as hard as I could. Uh, it bounced off the window. I couldn't believe it. But now I'm nose to nose with this shatter pattern and I knew it put a lot of force into creating it. So I had a lot of respect for this thing. And I was going through a phase of uh, burning spiders in their, in, their, in their webs up till then. So that counted as sort of a shatter pattern, like had this multifaceted interest in this thing. But immediately, which seemed like ages, I was, people rushed out of the pub, threw me on the floor, sat on my back, and I've got feet on my wrists and ankles. And I'm sat there, laying there in that spread eagled in, a, in silence, pretty much, because I wasn't, I, I was a problem. And people wanted to see what I was doing next. I wasn't going to do anything. Then the um, police arrived and a chair went up and I, they put me in cuffs and I was put in the back of this van. I thought, wow, my dad knows a lot of uh, powerful people. because so I thought I was being uh, rewarded for having damaged this pub in his name. So I was sitting there thinking, this is great. I'm, go I'm on my way to, on my way to, um, to City, Univers City uh, Airport or Stansted. I'm going to get flown first class to, to the Maldives. But obviously that wasn't true. I was in my car, so I thought, right, okay, maybe it would just, let's assume that I'm not going to the, to the, to the airport. I've, I've seen enough uh, action films, like all the Bourne films, Bond films. So I'll jump through my cuffs. When they open the, the doors at the other end of the journey, I'll overpower the policeman and then uh, run and uh, drive off in the van. So I thought this is perfect, entirely possible. Then it, it further dawned on me that I probably wouldn't be able to overpower these people. So I climbed back through my cuffs, uh, so they're around the front of me instead, and I waited until we parked. I was in and out of lots of different cells at that time. My head was sort of swirling a bit. This is like three days, three nights, I believe, without my medication. So my parents knew where I was now. They knew that I, I was safe and I was in custody, but, you know, I was safe and well kind of thing. I hadn't been killed or anything. So 
first thing I did when I got into any cell, if I could, throw my bedding on the floor. Just, just you want to rebel, you want to re rebel against everything. Then I'd sing at the top of my voice. I can't remember which songs they were, but at one point I was even given a cigarette just to, if I would shut up and stop singing. So another time, I was in a more serious prison, I was um, given a load of bedding to carry to my cell, which you see in films and things like that. And that was serious. I thought it was going well. This Russian bloke was in my was my cellmate. I was reading him his papers, and then my cigarettes went missing. I thought, yeah, okay, well that dominant hierarchy is established. I'm not going to challenge it. And the second one, some bloke was uh, doing heroin because I've seen him like ch chase the dragon with the foil and that. Uh, I'm laying there watching him. I turned it down. He said, "You want some?" I was like, yeah. um, and then he starts trashing the whole whole, whole cell. It turns out he's, he's trying to uh, get the attention of all the, all the prison guards. Uh, and he rushed out. When I, they rush in, he rushes out, blaming it on me. I'm laying there just stupefied on the top, thinking, what, why is he trashing? This is what happens when you smoke heroin. Anyway, so I'm carried down uh, to solitary confinement by like four, five prison guards, just carried bodily, you know. And um, I started singing again started uh, screaming like that. deep down I was terrified and that wouldn't stop me making noises strangely you could hear all the other noises um, so yeah they even sent in the prison chaplain at one point with a bodyguard and I thought afterwards that he'd secretly read me my last rites but uh, no I, I, I went back to hospital after that so they're the main main events, I suppose. The rest of this is, is like a uh, tick over my sort of day to day. I was really worried about glitter because I used to think every individual bit of glitter was an individual uh, recording device for your, your, your speech and your thoughts and a transmitter in each individual hexagon of glitter. So I was really worried about that, obviously, because um, I was worried about palindrome phrases at this point too. That for the uninitiated, uh, palindrome phrases uh, is when you're speaking with words, but you're um, conscious of the number of number number of letters in the words you use, and the order of those words in a sentence. So, Essex University is as a phrase is respectful because it's Essex me five university you ten. If I said University of Essex the other way around, then I, University, I was 10 of Essex, five. So if you said Southampton University, that's 10 and 10. So that's like, that's a platitude, if you like. No, I mean, it's just a sort of like terrible business. So I was worried about all these kinds of things. And if I walked into a room trying to uh, respect the spirits of the room, I suppose, I would say something like, Oh, this is fantastic because I've finished with the longer word so I would have all these phrases to try and balance the respect so I thought they were the Hells Angels the Knights Templar uh, the, the Sicilian Mafia the Illuminati and, and the Metropolitan Police all crowding around each of these glitter uh, and I would hear what they were doing in my head like move on his mum or move on his brother and that would really worry me so I go into these rooms not expecting don't know if they're actually dirty or clean rooms. Clean rooms wouldn't have any glitter. I was noticing this stuff as well at the time. Uh, and I was just, uh, in the spirit of, of being respectful, I'd say, oh, this is amazing. Because the amazing would be obviously the respectful way of putting it. Then I had this demon in my head that would say yet afterwards, which cancelled that, uh, the respectful phrase and made it, made it disrespectful. So overthinking things, um, I mean, glitter is just glitter. It is what it is, and it always has been. But for me, at the time, I, I was taking it to I was taking it to my psychiatrist uh, as evidence that I was getting surveilled. Another time, I was this is a creativity going bad. I was working for the Pope. Uh, he had a cardinal, cardinal, in a cardigan uh, under the Vatican, and I was I was to fly around the world. Right, he he knew I was. Uh, capable of being Superman and flying around the world, kryptonite being weed, green sort of substance that really off-putting for Superman. And 
this bloke, he would, he, he would read out the Latin spell from his dusty uh, library books. Um, and this spell would raise a demon up somewhere in the world. I would fly around the world like a Superman, find out where the demon came up, like Peru or Bolivia or Japan or, you know, Sweden, anywhere. And I'd have 20 minutes that that, to figure out a cage that would keep that, that demon contained particular um, for good. So 20 minutes adamantium cage, I'll be thinking to myself, lying in bed, that's all I'm doing. Uh, car with carbon, silicon, uh, carbon, uh, magnesium, carbon, uh, argon. They didn't have to make sense, but it was, it was, I was showing willing to help the Catholic Church. And then I think, okay, so magnesium barium. And ding, 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 that's it. So on to the next steam, and he'd read out a spell, fly around, find it, and it'd be like carbon and silicon or something. So very tense. Also, I had the, vic the, uh, the victim status. Uh, the geographer was trying to, trying to frame me. And uh, through the sounds of a ticking clock, every, sec every second was another syllable. It was like, uh, hello and uh, that would be like that so instead of background noise which basically an alarm clock is when it's ticking for me it would be like a direct instruction there would be different voices if you like like if you had an electric keyboard kind of voice so there would be a, a, a voice for like howling wind that would be telling me and you're wretched you're nothing you you're worth absolutely nothing less than nothing uh and then there would be like ticking clock and that he would that that sort of noise would be another voice saying really you're worth nothing there's no point going on and i was just going going to my head so uh after zero hour was the main thing uh i would be in permanent pain the whole time people would come up to me let's say some kid kicked me in the shin after zero hour he would get 500 pound transferred straight into his bank account uh increment like very varying degrees of pain if i got shot in the shoulder that could be like fifty thousand pounds for whoever did that because the geographer would have this this this, this strong psychic hold over people uh i was like snoopy because Wood, woodstock i thought was about the music he was flying around like he was a bit stoned you know and snoopy would sit there uh so yeah quite dark times my mum was just a godsend through the whole thing I don't think she could have handled it better. But one of my phases was that she was a demon and she had to be killed. So I would kill her in my head. This was the method. Um, and she would be on the floor. Then she would sort of swell up into a massive camp of, camp of site, camp of van sized, big pulsating, uh, fleshy black and green mass, putrid smelling, and I would have to uh, cut into the middle of this. It's like the real her kind of thing. Uh, cut right into the middle. Uh, find this uh, softball-sized ball inside. Uh, withdraw that ball. Smash it gently on a rock. And uh, return the billion-sized ball from inside that into the middle of this, this fleshy thing. Then the screaming and the sort of... Uh, would seal up. And then gradually it would fold in and in and in to a black hole. That would float about three or four feet above the ground and she'll be at this point she's half an hour left so she's desperately trying to keep get people interested like come with me into my world and i'll make all your dreams true all this kind of thing some people get sucked in but i'll be standing there trying to dissuade them all obviously um and then after that the the, the whole would sort of go back to where the corpse and suddenly the whole world would feel slightly better but they wouldn't know why and it's because of me um, my brother also, but he had a different way, the methodology of killing him as the person responsible for the initial killing. It would be up to them. If you mess up any of these stages up, uh, then that particular demon will live on and on and on forever. But uh, if you get them early in the right way, they won't. So uh, I kill my brother. He's on the floor and um, it sort of turns into a small uh, volcanic hole and all this flame and stuff is leaping out. But I have to think about animals and species and different things. So I think about horses. So you've got uh, 10 horses emerge out of the hole and canter off. Uh, 10 elephants come up out of this hole, they're spawned and they wander off. 
um, if I, I can't, couldn't think of an eleventh horse because you have to you have to uh, uh, stop it at ten. So owls they would sort of fly off. Um, if I had any sense, I suppose I would have thought something huge, like uh, Diplodocus or Tyrannosaurus. But um, eventually he would like use up all his energy, except he would then turn into a flaming figure, walk around for half an hour, uh, touching people slowly and burst into flames. And then uh, he'll go back to a corpse again and the whole world will feel slightly better. They wouldn't know why. The aftermath of all this, though, because it was so vivid in my own head, I was just lying in bed like Snoopy, just thinking of stuff. I couldn't stop, which was the main thing. Racing thoughts, they call it, intrusive racing thoughts. Um, I was worried, worried about all these extra, extra wildlife everywhere. I mean, like the RSPCA would be getting calls like, We've, we've, got, we've got an alligator on the front lawn. What are we supposed to do about that? This is like in London somewhere. Uh, the grass verges by the sides of the, um, the motorways, like armadillos and things. So yeah, it was, it was all so detailed and so lifelike, which was the worrying thing. So my mama said uh, she would always bring in tobacco. Um, that's very difficult to bring in for someone you love because you know it's, a, it's an unhealthy substance but she always would uh, and some uh, spending money not an awful lot obviously but um, black olives ah so love those and um, also uh, music uh, sony mini discs i had a mini disc player and i used to play those discs and that used to help pass the time so um oh also is yeah, it's the hardest thing to do when you, you call the GP on a friend or, or, your, or your son, your children. So do Tai Chi uh, on a Tuesday, normally. I mean, currently you've got a lockdown here and things like that, but um, that's very good. Lots of great, great knowledgeable, friendly people and uh, intelligent uh, and, and just compassionate, just willing to learn. So very lucky to know them. Uh, normally I do uh, two kilometers swimming. Um, my trusty items there. Uh, I had to uh, customize the towel, proud of that. I went two. Um, they were black and uh, burnt orange Reebok towels, but I didn't like the orange so much, so I dyed them with a blue dye and came out black and brown. Brilliant. Uh, and two different types of earplugs. You can get uh, plastic ones, if one's, but um, my doctor was like, no, silicon is the best. So I've got silicon and plastic, all my shower items and my water. And getting up early in the morning is so important if you want to sort of join the workforce, which I really, really do. So my circadian rhythm's now pretty, pretty well, much finessed. I don't want to say it's perfect, but I get up in the morning, like six, six o'clock in the morning, uh, which and, and get quite a lot of sleep as well. So I'm in bed by nine o'clock so that I can actually heal uh, and any physical like restorative uh, benefits are there. And there's a, the social side of this and the endorphins too and the weight gain, like I said. So it helps with many things. This is my, the book I uh, had published uh, May 2018, it took six years to write, but it's all of my uh, worst stories written down. So that's on Amazon, that's on Amazon still. So and my mum did, uh, designed the um, the cover. So these are my lectures that I've done uh, so far, starting February last year, and all wonderful people willing to take a chance on the service user like me. Just amazing, amazing people. And I've been asked back to a couple of them too. The future is looking really, really good. So thanks for letting me say all those things. <laughs> Uh, yeah, in my spare time, um, I do movie sushi po uh, podcast reviews on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and podcasts. Like, there's also a Poetry Cafe podcast um, where I post a, a, another poem every evening on Twitter. And these are my contact details. I'm just trying to make this last two. Really, and and um, yeah, so basically, that um that is uh, a journey through mental illness i want to say thank you to eileen kaner and to uh, stephanie haydecker for um taking a chance on me and um 
just basically uh, being very open-minded and uh, and hopefully um, spotting some talent, which would be good. on cannabis and lots of people saying you know actually it's fairly harmless the impact of cannabis on people's mental health is is overstated and i just wondered kind of what your view was as somebody who's had this lived experience um well i've heard that their uh, statistics are that one in seven people who who do get stoned or, or or mashed or high are likely to have psychotic symptoms at some point in their lives so this this wouldn't be a harmless thing uh that would be to call psychosis harmless which can lead to all sorts of nasty things and it can take up so much time and effort and it's not just the person who's smoking it or eating the cookies or brownies that seem like there's no impact at the time but it's putting the, fa the family and the friends and the wider community through so many different problems that you don't see they were a choice you know on some level and uh if I could, I could spare people that much, the pain that I've been through, and I know I've put others through around me, uh, I definitely would spare them that. And um, just think twice if, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you think you have to do it. A moment ago, you mentioned your impact on family and you mentioned that in your lecture. I wonder if you've got kind of thoughts or, or messages for those who you feel may be impacted by the, the substance misuse of others and or what we could be saying to those family and friends that are trying to support somebody around kind of mental health conditions and mental health conditions where somebody's maybe trying to self-medicate through um, substance misuse. Um, well, I, 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 it, for me, um, it became so bad that I was, I ended up, uh, it, my mum came round to the flat I was living in and um, she saw me like holding my knees, hugging my knees, rocking to myself, humming and, and, and avoiding her eye, eyesight. And um, that, was, that was when something had to be done. That's when the ultimate step, I suppose, is that you realise you can't take care of your kids. You're going to have to get the doctor to take care of them or at least interview them formally. Um, which can then bring into place all the other resources that that doctor has in store uh, to help that person, that young person, because um, sometimes parents don't have all the answers, but to realize that perhaps in this situation you don't, it's a very, very brave thing for someone close to someone suffering with, with weed use to do. That could have happened to me at the time. I felt a little bit betrayed mm -hmm. and alienated, but in the long run, uh, I respect her so much more for that, my mum. That's great. And I, I heard you, oh, I think we might have lost your... Okay, I don't know if we lost your sound a little bit there, Ads, if you can hear okay. us. Okay, that's great. Um, Ads, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, it's come through from a couple of people here as well. They've said, what really wanted you, motivated you to want to share your story? What, what was the thing that kind of pushed you to want to do that? Um, well, I realised how unique it was and, and how like detailed and um, I knew that it had consumed so much of my time, all these thoughts, these weird and wonderful um, worries and nightmares and things that I thought were real. That zero hour thing, like could be tonight, obviously it's not, but um, I was just so like my belief system 
was upside down and uh, I wanted to remember it for what it was uh, as a distant thing and grow, growing more distant all the time. But to crystallize those ideas, put them in a book, um, in lectures where they can do some good because otherwise it was just a whole load of worry and petri being petrified all the time. But if I can turn it around and like this, uh, teach people how to be better carers on all sorts of levels, then um, I'm happy to do that. That's, that's pretty much what made me do that. You mentioned putting it down in, in the written word and, you know, we've often hear that the written word is thought crystallised and it sounds like your motivation was to, to benefit others. Um, yeah. One of the questions that we've been given tonight from our audience is that someone's um, sort of reported that they assumed cannabis would cloud thoughts and memories, but you seem to remember things with, with great clarity. Mm. Um, they're wondering if you ever encounter times of kind of confusion or, or forgetfulness as a result of your lived experience. Um, yeah, I'll be forgetful of uh, everyday things, but I think in psychology, uh, there are different types of memory. Um, some are like, like short-term memory, uh, and some are long-term memory, and they're stored in different parts of the brain. Uh, these, um, these nightmares, like Stephen King-esque stuff that I was going through, was so emotive though, at the time, and I would be repeated uh, through ticking clocks, any sort of extraneous sounds, the same uh, problem, like this is gonna happen to you tonight, this mm -hmm. will happen to you the night after. And every day uh, I'm inculcated with the same message, the same details, the thing about the Pope with the periodic table and Superman, this would be repeated and repeated until it was like fever pitch in my head. I didn't wanna tell anyone because I felt I would inc incriminate them because it's such the, potential, the potency of these ideas was so emotive and visceral for me that I couldn't hide from them and I had to put them in a book because now I'm sort of remembering that, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to go for a walk tomorrow morning like I always do, like regular stuff. Or, you know, it's my turn to cook tonight because uh, it, it's, it's normal things. So they sort of took precedence. And that's really interesting because you talk about it sounds like one of the things that stopped you speaking up sooner was fear that you would somehow incriminate other people you had so it sounds like your desire to stay quiet to some degree was to safeguard people exactly yeah, yeah. i mean I, I couldn't tell anyone that i thought my mum was going to swell up into like cut into her and like she's going to sort of for a start she's a demon who controls the insides of people's bodies i mean this is this is uh, this was idle thought and i was like far too i had no sort of serious side i thought it's all about partying non-stop partying and uh no real thought for the future like because the thing about psychosis when you're in the middle of it that there's no like five-year plan there's no like five minute plan it's like if i if i do this that that will happen um but you never think beyond that so yeah it's it, very sort of hazy memories of trying to do normal things so yeah so thinking about that kind of, you know, long term planning, you said there's there's no, you know, you're kind of living for the moment. There's no sense of if I do this, the kind of longer term impact. So looking back in retrospect, if you could speak to your younger self, what kind of advice or, or guidance or message would you would you want to share with them? Um, maybe like don't keep testing the doctors because um, in 99 when I was first in hospital, um, I wasn't at, I couldn't access any THC, psychoactive compound in weed. So they put me on uh, soul pride. It, it, it's, it's trial and error with these people, because especially when you're going off the ward, getting, getting stoned again and back on the ward. Read, so increase the soul pride or add risperidone or uh, olanzapine, something like that. Um, if I had just stayed with the soul pride, that, that would have been it. And, but now I'm on like three different like uh, antipsychotics and some pills for the, the, the side effects. So it, there's been a compound, uh, sort of approach but the, the THC was always the unknown quantity mm -hmm. uh, so yeah it was, it was just to like do what the doctors tell you get some sleep and uh, respect yourself and you'll come through it okay so that sounds like kind of some level of self-investment while doing your best to work as well as you can with those that are offering you that that kind of clinical support and maybe familial support as well yeah yeah. Okay. I've got a, a question from Pat, uh, and she's, I guess it's a killer question, really. She says, what was key to your recovery? Yeah, I, 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 I wish there was a simple answer to this, but I think it was just, I mean, my family were just godsends all the, all the way through. They were very, very helpful, approachable. They, they knew I'd come through it. 
Um, so part of it was like, I sh you know, why do I keep doing this to myself? Uh, there is there is such a thing called psychological addiction to cannabis. I didn't realize there was an, an, an allergy that I had. Um, so like night after night, there was no zero hour that night. So perhaps it won't be tonight or the night after. And then I started building on them real plans to do normal things. And, you know, before long, I was doing a weekly shop and normal things. Um, but I mean, I had such support from my, my, my loved ones and I couldn't have done it without them. So. So for you, it sounds like it was kind of getting back to some level of kind of day-to-day -day routine, which might sound a little mundane if you've lived for partying, but actually being able to do yeah. the weekly shop was a kind of demonstration of progress for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, there were so many different, um, well, there was Mind and then there was Rethink and uh, a number of charities that had outreach programmes uh, as well as CPNs, things like, you know, uh, keep all your documents, your utility bills in a, in a folder for each year mm -hmm. and after three years, you know, start recycling them and keep them for, you know, uh, deep clean the kitchen every now and then, stuff like that. But to like a party animal would be like, uh, what, I went through a point one time of uh, ashing on the floor from my, my lounge chair, because I, I, I thought it doesn't matter anyway. And this is probably what like a rock star would do, just completely deluded. And if I'd stopped doing the cannabis as a one in seven of these people, it would have cleared it up so fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think it, what you're describing is some kind of mastery over your life, you know, so it sounds very simple, like cleaning your kitchen, deep cleaning your kitchen or organising your, your kind of domestic paperwork. But to, to you, that sounded like it was steps towards recovery because you were gaining control and mastery over those what seemed like mundane, you know, responsibilities to many of us, but actually really key at that time for you. Yeah, uh, it made me feel I mean, they're healthy occupations, you know, OTs that I met were always very helpful. Um, so a, a sim, yeah, a simple thing like making making a meal or something. Um, you think, ah, oh, you just get on with it. Cook the pasta, cook the, the mince, you know, put them together, put some cheese on. But when you're like constantly bombarded by these mental like uh, spectres and sort of ogres, like you, you get distracted, hmm. uh, and fear is a terrible thing. Um, so yeah, it can make you do some strange things. And it, one of the things it didn't want me to do was to cook and sort of live a good life. Mm -hmm. so, Okay. I'm conscious we only have a, a couple of minutes left. Um, what is, I'm, I'm interested, what, what is it the kind of a question that you would have hoped somebody would have asked tonight, a key kind of question that we think, oh, that's a, a real key message I'd like to get across? Um, I think, uh, Adam, how's, how are your podcasts doing? Yeah, tell us a bit about your podcast. You know, so I'm a bit of a podcast addict, I have to be honest. You know, even during lockdown, walking the dog, headphones on, tell us a bit about your podcast. I've got one podcast called Ad Gridley's The Geographer, which is a, basically an audio book, but for free. Mm -hmm. um, another one is uh, Ad Gridley's Poetry Cafe. There's 14 uh, episodes over 14 weeks, I think, on there, and one I've ad added every week. And also Ad Gridley's Movie Sushi, which is like synopses of uh, popular films like Borat, the, Go the Godfather, School of Rock, and other things so yeah it's not all like uh, Merck and sort of like I used to be smooth to them. it's sort of like there is a, there is a gold there is a um, silver lining and uh, yeah yeah your podcast content sounds like not somebody who's survived but somebody who's actually thriving yeah. and able to give on to, to other people okay. that's that's been fantastic thank you so so much um we basically have to kind of come to a close now so i, I just want to really give our thanks to you not just for your time but for sharing your lived experience in such a candid way i have no doubt that it's going to have a positive impact i think we spoke earlier at the beginning and i said you know i'm not one to shy away from difficult subject matters because i think if we do that it instigates shame um, and so i think at the very least tonight you will have reduced some shame and maybe helped people to open those conversations if only about sushi movies <laughs> um, so thank you so much we hope everybody's going to be able to join us next time you know if you keep looking at our insights public lectures there'll be many more and as hopefully you'll join us in the audience next time if not as yeah. our key speaker brilliant yeah i'd love to thanks Sally. thank you so much